Okay, so I have here the SV Boni 220 3 nanometer bandpass H alpha oxygen 3 um, filter here. So this is a direct competitor to something like the Optolong L-Extreme, and it is a very narrow band filter. So what this means is that uh, this filter allows us to reject all the light except the light from two tiny slices of color. One is called the hydrogen alpha color, it's in the deep red. The other is called the uh, oxygen three color and that's around the uh, blue green side of the uh, spectrum. And what is very important about those two slices of color is that they are the colors that are the most emitted by emission nebulae uh, that we often image and also planetary nebulae as well. So the uh, veil nebula for instance, which I'll show an example of taken with this filter uh, later in this video, so uh, stay tuned, uh, or things like the Ariane Nebula, the uh, North America Nebula, M27, the Dumbbell, Dumbbell Nebula, all of those nebulae they emit in those particular wavelengths. And uh, what's very important with narrowband filter and very interesting is that the tinier, the smaller, the more narrow the bandpass is, the more they reject all of the parasitic light from light pollution and other wavelengths of light, while still keeping basically, well not, not exactly 100%, but the same amount of target signal. So you have a very thin slice of target signal in each of those two colors that you want to get, and so you you basically make the bandpass around this tiny sliver as small as possible to capture the least parasite light as you can. So that's what three nanometer uh, filters excel at. Uh, they do have a drawback on the H alpha side of things is that right next to H alpha, there's another uh, tiny sliver of light that we like. It's called N2, I believe. And uh, that one is actually very common in planetary nebulae like the Dumbbell Nebula M27. And so for these kind of nebulae, it's probably better to have slightly wider bandpass around H alpha. So you capture both H alpha and N2 at the same time. So that's not going to be the case with this particular filter or with any other three nanometer bandpass filters around H alpha for that matter. So it's something to be aware of. Another thing to be aware of is that this type of filter, especially when they are narrow like this, are not suitable for very fast optics. So for instance, I would not recommend something like this or any three nanometer filter for that matter for any telescope that is a bit faster than F4. So if they're like F3.5, F3, F2.8, F2, don't use them with standard three nanometer narrowband filters. Uh, limit yourself, maybe 3.8 is kind of okay, but yeah, you want to be like F4 and slower. This is because of a phenomenon called bandpass shift. I've covered that a lot on the channel, so I will not go into details. Okay, so this filter there, how much does it cost? Well, it comes in two versions. I'm checking the website right now. One is the two inch filter, which is what I have, which is compatible with most telescopes and large sensor cameras. So if you have a full frame APS-C size or even micro four thirds sensor, you probably want to go with this size. And this one is, the raw price is 322 US dollars. Currently it's on sale for uh, 290 US dollars. This is compared to its direct competitor that has on paper the same specs, the Optolong L-Extreme, which I believe is 330 uh, US dollars. So very close in price. And then there's a second version, which is a 1.25 inch uh, filter version uh, mounted, which is good for smaller sensor like the uh, ASI 533 or the 585 sensors would be perfect for that. If you have the filter wheel for that, you, then you can save a lot of money by going with smaller filter. And in that case, the filter, the raw price is 155 US dollars. So basically more than twice as cheap and the uh, price on sale right now 140 US dollars. So uh, for the 1.25 inch it is uh, quite a cheap filter and uh, yeah if you have a small sensor camera that's uh, uh, spoiler alert probably a no-brainer. Anyway let's look at the uh, filter itself. So it's called the SV220 3 nanometer. Um, it's a bit of a shame that they didn't name it differently because they already have a SV220 for seven nanometer band passes, so it might be easy to get confused. But what you get in the box is the usual stuff for SV Boni. You get a nice case with the filter inside, and you get a small measurement chart, which is not the individual filter measurement, as far as I know. I did ask SV Boni to make sure that they would send me a filter at random, which they said they did, and also that I checked that they had uh, some professional uh, spectrophotometers to actually be able to check 
you know, their, their batches of filters and they do, they gave me the number, uh, the model number basically, and they also told me they had to do some modifications to make sure it worked well with three nanometer filter band passes, which is always good to know that the company is doing its due diligence when it comes to measuring the filters. Inside the box, you get the filter and what's pretty cool is that uh, I, I've seen that on SV Boni filters recently, they have those uh, little peel off type of uh, things on top of the filter to make sure that they really arrive pristine here. Uh, so this is, by the way, not the first time I opened the filter. I've already tested it on the telescope behind me. Uh, it's just a recreation of the original unboxing experience. So there's the second uh, peel off kind of uh, thingy there. And there it is. Now the filter is available for us and we can put it in our optics. So yeah, standard three nanometers two inch mounted filters. So this is the equipment that I'll use it for. This is the uh, ASI 2600 MC Air camera. So it has the integrated control center like ASI Air within the camera and a guide chip as well in the camera. And I have the, the aluminum or the, the silver adapter here is actually the back part of my SQF55 telescope behind me. So I will be basically screwing in the filter within the uh, telescope itself. So quite a bit ahead of the camera sensor rather than using a filter drawer because I basically never use a filter drawer with this particular camera. Okay, here we have our test bench. So the filter I already showed you, it's inside the telescope around uh, here. And we have an autofocuser, we have the smart camera there, and we have the amazing SQF55 Super Sharp Telescope with the ZWAM5N mount underneath for you know good tracking overall. So this is the test bench. I will be using it to basically point this to a bright star. So I chose Deneb. I will take 30 minutes worth of exposures on Deneb after doing proper autofocus. And that way we'll be able to see if there's halos on bright stars, at least with this configuration. Then I'll be pointing it at the Veil Nebula, which is currently around like uh, 7 p.m. when it gets really dark here. It's already going down towards the, uh, the light dome, the pollution light dome of my Tokyo rooftop here. So it's really like the worst case scenario for this kind of a filter. We're already in a Bordel 8-9 zone in Tokyo, and it's also more than half full moon already, and it's growing. And we'll have a target that I'll be imaging for around two hours while it is getting low onto the, uh, onto the light dome of the horizon. So the worst conditions possible, and we'll see what uh, we're able to uh, get. But also, I want to show you that I took this filter and I measured it with a spectrophotometer. So before I show you the results on the uh, stars themselves, I'll show you uh, how it measured and whether it performed up to specifications. So let's go inside and have a look. Oh, and before we go inside, if you want to help the channel out, please watch the video till the end. It's the only metric these days that YouTube looks like, looks at. And also you can leave a comment. Let me know what you think of this filter and how you think it will perform. While you're there, leave a like on the video. It also helps out. And if you want to help even more and you're planning on buying anything from Agena, High Point Scientific, even Amazon or SV Boni for that matter, if you do so after clicking one of the links I have down in the description, it will help me out at no cost to you. And if you want to have the channel even more, become like a VIP, a, a really, like a real supporter, sponsor of the channel um, who make all of this possible, you can become a Patreon member. The link is down in the description, or you can become a channel member. It's the join button next to the subscribe button and Patreon members, uh, channel members, you know it. You make all of this possible. So thank you so much for your support without which this would no, just not be possible. So let's go. Okay, so now that we've introduced the filter and we understand what it's capable of doing in comparison with wider narrowband filters or even broadband filters, we need to check whether the filter specifications are actually, you know, what the filter is able to do. <laughs> because I use a spectrophotometer to actually measure the band passes of the filters that I test to make sure that they are actually what the manufacturer claims. And far more often than it should, uh, the filters might be a bit out of specification, like the band passes are kind of like shifted, which makes the filter useless uh, with fast optics completely, or even with slow optics, it starts to be like a bit iffy and it's not transmitting as much light as it should. And so that's a problem. So I took my little spectrometer and I measured this SV Boni SV220 three nanometer 
uh, HAO3 filter, a short name, very uh, rolls of the tongue. And here we have the results on my computer screen. So this chart is in the x-axis. It is the uh, wavelength in nanometers of the uh, light. And on the y-axis, it is the transmission of the uh, filter. And I've basically been able to um, verify that if you look at the peak of that guy, it's 500.5 uh, nanometer. So that's exactly what we need for oxygen-3, which is 500.7 nanometer. And we see transmission percentage of around 84%. Note that due to the limitations of my spectrophotometer, uh, when I measure very narrow band passes, like three nanometer, my spectrophotometer will tend to underestimate the uh, transmission. So we, I would expect to it to be actually a bit more than 85%, maybe almost 90%, something like that, which is pretty good for oxygen-3, especially since it seems to be perfectly centered. That said, on this oxygen-3 bandpass, I measured more or less four nanometers of uh, full width half max rather than three nanometer, but still pretty good. I'm not too you know, scared about this uh, small change. Let's look at H-alpha. Okay, so H-alpha at the very top, it's 656.5 to uh, 656, and we're trying to get 656.3. So again, this is perfectly centered, which is very, very nice. The uh, transmittance is a bit higher than oxygen-3 at 87%, so probably a bit above 90%, maybe 92%, something like that, due to the limitation of my measurement equipment. And this time, the uh, full width half max that I measured is exactly 3 nanometers. So this is exactly as per, uh, as per specification. So in our particular case, oxygen-3 is perfectly centered, good transmission, slightly too wide full width half max for the price I can't really complain. H-alpha is perfect in every way, as far as I can tell. So this is very good. I'm unable with my spectrophotometer to uh, measure the off-band blocking, which is apparently an average of OD5, which is actually very good. Uh, so I have to trust SV Boonie for that and look at the results that I get with my images. By the way, I'm obviously measuring a single sample of, of the SV2203 nanometer, and so there could be variation between samples. I don't know. That said, there's at least one other person, James Thompson, um, who has measured the filter and done a huge amount of analysis. I highly recommend going through his article. I'm not 100% sure about the methodology that is used to, with some of those comparisons. I can see there could be issues, uh, but overall amazing article. And, I, uh, and he also gets measurements of the filters uh, that are quite good. So it's at least two filters that were good. And I'll put the link to that down in the description and the uh, pinned comment. Okay, now let's look at the results of image. So first thing, I pointed the equipment to the NEB with the uh, filter in the telescope itself. And this is the kind of reflections that we see. Like this is, to be clear, six times five minutes exposures. Uh, so 30 minutes total on a very bright star. And, and yeah, if you squint, there might be a bit of a halo, but that's not much of a halo at all. So it's almost like my sample in the way that I set it up is halo free. Uh, but again, if you go to James Thompson's article, you will see that he gets a more pronounced halo. So there could be some filter to filter variants, or it simply could be that the, because I've put the uh, filter in the telescope itself, further away from the camera, that I don't get a halo. I'm not sure at this, uh, at this stage, but at least I see very good results there. Then, of course, I spent a bit over two hours on the entirety of the uh, Veil Nebula. Uh, so I think 27 times 5 minutes exposures as the Veil Nebula was going down and down and down more and more into the dome of light pollution. This is my result straight out of camera. So this is from Tokyo with more than a half moon just a bit over two hours on the Veil Nebula. And this shows already a lot of potential. We see all of the um, aspects of the, uh, the Veil Nebula in, in general. And yeah, I really like that. I like taking an image of the entirety of the thing at, the, at one time. Uh, so I did some processing, you know, the typical stuff, removing the, uh, the background, doing some color compensation. There we go. So now we have the blues instead of the greens and, you know, keeping uh, doing the noise reduction, blur exterminator, all of this good stuff, then stretching the image. And now the, the image stretched already looks pretty, uh, pretty sweet, in my opinion. Like, this is only a bit over two hours from Tokyo. <laughs> uh, I love this. 
I, I love astrophotography. Uh, yeah, so let's keep going. I do some more changes in terms of curves and in the starless image, this is what we get. I mean, this is, this is pretty neat. Uh, small telescope, really good camera, and the filter is really helping me take this image. After I do some uh, image blend, this is the, uh, the result that I get. So I put back the stars, this is what we get. And then I can reduce the stars. And after star reduction, this is what we get. And this is more or less my final image to taste. You could uh, you know, reduce the stars even more and get this. So the nebulosity is even more striking than originally. But it, it's hard for me to believe, even though I took this image myself, that this was taken from my Tokyo rooftop under a bit more than a half moon as the target was going down into the, uh, the light dome. Now, of course, I, I don't like to base my reviews off of the images, my filter reviews off of the images that I can get because I can get great images with seven nanometer uh, narrowband filters. I can get great images with wider filters like the L Enhance or the C1 and the C2. So it's a bit like, you know, kind of flexing, like, look at uh, what I'm able to do. Uh, but yeah, this time, uh, definitely the narrow band passes are helping a lot and allow me to get this result. And one thing as well that I want to, uh, to mention is that the star at the top, which is pretty bright actually, and is, could be prone to halos, does not show any halo, at least I can see, even with two hours of data. Even if I go back to the uh, original image, so this is the original image. I still don't see a halo there. So this feels like um, a very, yeah, it's, it's a very good filter and it competes directly against the Optolong L Extreme. It is slightly cheaper, especially when it's on sale. So yeah, I mean, I don't think you can go wrong with it, assuming that all of the samples are on par with what uh, James and myself have received. And yeah, that's like fingers crossed. I cannot obviously guarantee that, but otherwise it feels like a very good value for the, uh, for the money. And I'll have, of course, links down in the description. I'll check also with SV Money whether I can get some coupon available for you guys so you can get it even cheaper. So yeah, I'll, I'll put uh, that in the description if there is a coupon available. So what do you think of uh, this filter? Is that something you would consider? Do you already have like a seven nanometer filter and you were planning on going to something much narrower because you're in a light polluted area? Let me know down in the comments. Thank you so much for watching till, till the end, by the way. And if you want to help even more and you're planning on buying anything from Agena, High Point Scientific, Amazon, or SV Boni, if you do so after clicking one of the links that I have down in the description or the pinned comment, it will help me out at no cost to you. If you want to support me directly, become a sponsor of the channel, you can join my Patreon. The link is down in the description. You can join my channel as a member. It's the join button next to the subscribe button. You guys, you know it. You make all of this adventure possible, all of these videos possible. So as always, thank you so much for your generosity. But with that, I hope this was useful. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget whenever you can to look up at the stars and I'll see you next time.